Chapter Six of the Life of Reverend Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Martin was much dejected in contemplating the vast multitude of idolaters amongst whom he was now placed. Everything presented the appearance of wretchedness. I thought of my future labors among them with some despondency. Yet I am willing, I trust, through grace, to pass my days among them if by any means these poor people may be brought to god the sight of men women and children all idolaters makes me shudder as if in the dominions of the prince of darkness i fancy the frown of god is visible there is something peculiarly awful in the stillness that prevails whether it is the relaxing influence of the climate or what i do not know but there is everything here to depress the spirits all nature droops whilst he almost despaired of the possibility of ever accomplishing any good himself he rejoiced in the promises and prophecies which make it sure that at some day the true god shall be worshipped there and in every other place and the gospel of jesus christ be proclaimed to every nation under heaven he was animated by the thought that even should he never see a native converted yet it might be God's design to encourage future missionaries by giving them his example of patience and continuance in the work. He took up his residence at Aldeen, near Calcutta, in the house of an English clergyman, where, after recovering from a dangerous attack of fever, he experienced great enjoyment in the company of several Christians, missionaries and others, established in the neighborhood. Strong persuasions were used to induce him to remain in Calcutta, but that city was supplied in some measure with the gospel, and it was his intention to devote himself to more remote heathens. The celebrated Dr. Buchanan had left Calcutta on a journey to Syria at the very time that Martin was arriving, and too soon to know that God had thus answered the prayers which he and his brethren had been for some time addressing to heaven for the sending of more missionaries to India. On the 15th of October, Mr. Martin left Aldine and Calcutta for Dinapur, a town on the Ganges, more than three hundred miles distant. He went in a boat called a Budgero, with a cabin fitted for travelling, which, as it is moved principally by towing with poles, does not go farther than about twenty miles in a day, stopping in the evening. He employed his time in studying the Eastern languages, in which he was assisted by a native teacher, called a Munshi, who accompanied him. He several times witnessed the idolatrous ceremonies of the people, and made some attempts to convince them of the sinfulness and folly of the devotion they paid to idols of their own carving, and to the river Ganges itself. At several villages on the route he attempted to speak to the people, and distributed tracts. Some parts of his own narrative of this tour will show how he employed himself, and how he was upheld in his purpose amidst all discouragements. October 19th, Sunday. The first solitary Sabbath spent among the heathen, but my soul not forsaken of God. The prayers of my dear friends were instant for me this day, I well perceive, and a great part of my prayer was occupied in delightful intercession for them. The account of the fall of man in the third chapter of Genesis, and of his restoration by Christ, was unspeakably affecting to my soul. Indeed, everything I read seemed to be carried home to my soul with ineffable sweetness and power by the Spirit, and all that was within me blessed his holy name. In the afternoon, sent to the Munshi, that he might hear the gospel read, or read it himself, began St. Mark, but our conversation turning from Christianity to Mohammedism became deadening to my spirit. Our course to-day was along the eastern bank, which seems to have been lately the bed of the river, and is bare of trees for a considerable distance from the water. The western bank is covered with wood. In my evening walk saw three skeletons. October 20th employed all the day in translating the first chapter of the acts into hindustani i did it with some care and wrote it all out in the persian character yet still i am surprised i do so little i walked into the village where the boat stopped for the night and found the worshippers of kali by the sound of their drums and cymbals 
I did not think of speaking to them on account of their being Bengalis, but being invited by the Brahmins, note, Hindu priests, end of note, to walk in, I entered within the railing, and asked a few questions about the idol. The Brahmin, who spoke bad Hindustani, disputed with great heat, and his tongue ran faster than I could follow, and the people, who were about one hundred, shouted applause. But I continued to ask my questions, without making any remarks upon the answers. I asked, among other things, whether what I had heard of Vishnu and Brahma was true, which he confessed. I forbore to press him with the consequences, which he seemed to feel, and then I told him what was my belief. The man grew quite mild, and said it was chula bat, good words, and asked me seriously at last what I thought, was idol worship true or false? I felt it a matter of thankfulness that I could make known the truth of God, though but a stammerer, and that I had declared it in the presence of the devil. And this also I learnt, that the power of gentleness is irresistible. I never was more astonished than at the change in deportment of this hot-headed Brahmin. October 21. Afternoon, with my munshi, correcting Acts 1, and felt a little discouraged at finding I still wrote so incorrectly, though much pleased at this great apparent desire of having it perfectly accurate. Though not joyful in my spirit as when my friends left me, I feel my God to be an all-satisfying portion, and find no want of friends. Read Genesis and Luke at night in the Septuagint and Hindustani. October 22. A Brahmin of my own age was performing his devotions to the Ganges early this morning when I was going to prayer. My soul was struck with the sovereignty of God, who, out of pure grace, had made such a difference in all the external circumstances of our lives. Oh, let not that man's earnestness rise up in judgment against me at the last day. In the afternoon they were performing the ceremony of throwing the images of Kali, collected from several villages, into the river. In addition to the usual music, there were trumpets. The objects of worship, which were figures most gorgeously bedecked with tinsel, were kept under a little awning in their respective boats. As the Bujaro passed through the boats, they turned, so as to present the front of their goddess to me, and at the same time blew a blast with their trumpet, evidently intending to gratify me with a sight of what appeared to them so fine. Had their employment been less impious, I should have returned the compliment by looking, but I turned away. Came to on the eastern bank, below a village called Agadeep, Wherever I walked, the women fled at the sight of me. Some men were sitting under the shed dedicated to their goddess, and a lamp was burning in her place. A conversation soon began, but there was no one who could speak Hindustani, so all I could say was by the medium of my Mussulman interpreter. They said that they only did as others did, and that, if they were wrong, then all Bengal was wrong. I felt love for their souls, and longed for utterance to declare unto these poor simple people the holy gospel. I think that when my mouth is opened I shall preach to them day and night. I feel that they are my brethren in the flesh, precisely on a level with myself. October 25th had a very solemn season of prayer, by the favour of God, over some of the chapters of Genesis, but especially at the conclusion of the 119th Psalm. Oh, that these holy resolutions and pious breathings were entirely my own! Adored be the never-failing mercy of God! He has made my happiness to depend, not on the uncertain connections of this life, but upon his own most blessed self, a portion that never faileth. Came to on the eastern bank. The opposite side was very romantic, adorned by a stately range of very high forest trees, whose deep dark shade seemed impenetrable to the light. In my evening walk enjoyed great solemnity of feeling, in the view of the world as a mere wilderness through which the children of God are passing to a better country. It was a comforting and a solemn thought, and was unspeakably interesting to me at the time, that God knew whereabouts his people were in the wilderness, and was supplying them with just what they wanted. October 26th, Sunday. 
passed this Lord's Day with great comfort and much solemnity of soul. Glory to God for his grace. Reading the scriptures and prayer took up the first part of the day. Almost every chapter I read was blessed to my soul, particularly the last chapter of Isaiah. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, etc. Rejoice, my soul, in the sure promises of Jehovah. How happy am I when, in preparing for the work of declaring his glory among the Gentiles, I think that many of the Lord's saints have been this day remembering their unworthy friend. I felt as if I could never be tired with prayer. In the afternoon, read one of Gilbert's French sermons, Bates on Death, and some of the Negri Gospels. In the evening, we came to on the eastern bank. I walked into a neighboring village with some tracts. The children ran away in great terror, and though there were some men here and there, I found no opportunity or encouragement to try if there were any that could speak Hindustani. However, I felt vexed with myself for not taking more pains to do them good. Alas, while Satan is destroying their souls, does it become the servants of God to be lukewarm? October 27th. Arrived at Burrampore. In the evening walked out to see the cantonments at the hospital, in which there were one hundred and fifty European soldiers sick. I was talking to a man said to be dying when a surgeon entered. I went up and made some apology for entering the hospital. It was my old schoolfellow and townsman, blank. The remainder of the evening he spent with me in my budgerow. He pressed me much to stay longer with him, which I refused. But afterwards, on reflection, I thought it my duty to stay a little longer, thinking I might have an opportunity of preaching to the soldiers. October 28th. Rose very early, and was at the hospital at daylight. Waited there a long time, wandering up and down the wards, in hopes of inducing the men to get up and assemble. But it was in vain. I left three books with them, and went away amidst the sneers and titters of the common soldiers. Certainly it is one of the greatest crosses I am called to bear, to take pains to make people hear me. It is such a struggle between a sense of propriety and modesty on the one hand, and a sense of duty on the other, that I find nothing equal to it. I could force my way anywhere in order to introduce a brother minister, but for myself I act with hesitation and pain. Mr. Blank promised to ask the head surgeon's permission for me to preach, and appointed the hour at which I should come. I went there, but after waiting two hours was told that the surgeon was gone without being spoken to, and many other excuses were made. So, as it was now the heat of the day, I saw it was of no use to make any more attempts, and therefore I went on my way. November 2, Sunday. My mind was greatly oppressed that I had done and was doing nothing in the way of distributing tracts. To free my conscience from the charge of unprofitableness and neglect, I wished to go ashore in the middle of the day, wherever I thought I might meet people, but did not land till we came to on the banks of the Ganges, which we entered just before sunset. Walking on shore, I met with a very large party, and entering into conversation, I asked if any of them could read. One young man, who seemed superior in rank to the rest, said he could, and accordingly read some of the only Negri tract that I had. I then addressed myself boldly to them, and told them of the gospel. When speaking of the inefficacy of the religious practices of the Hindus, I mentioned as an example the repetition of the name of Ram. The young man assented to this, and said, Of what use is it? As he seemed to be of a pensive turn, and said this with marks of disgust, I gave him a Negri testament, the first I have given. May God's blessing go along with it, and cause the eyes of multitudes to be opened. The men said they should be glad to receive tracts, so I sent them back a considerable number by the young man. The idea of printing the parables in proper order, with a short explanation subjoined to each, for the purpose of distribution, and as school-books, suggested itself to me to-night, and delighted me prodigiously. November 8th Early this morning reached Rajamal and walked to view the remains of its ancient splendor. 
gave a tract or two to a Brahmin, but the Dak Munshi, a Mussulman, when he received one of the Hindustani tracts and found out what it was, was greatly alarmed, and after many awkward apologies returned it, saying that a man who had his legs in two different boats was in danger of sinking between them. Went on, much discouraged at the suspicion and rebuffs I met with, or rather pained, for I feel not the less determined to use every effort to give the people the gospel. Oh, that the Lord would pour out upon them a spirit of deep concern for their souls! In a walk at Rajamal met some of the hill people, wrote down from their mouth some of the names of things. From their appearance they seemed connected with the Hottentots and Chinese. Passed the day in correcting Acts, chapter 3, with the Munchi. At night walked with Mr. G. into a village, where we met with some more of the hill people. With one of them, who was a Mangi, or chief, of one of the hills, I had some conversation in Hindustani, and told him that wicked men, after death, go to a place of fire, and good men above to God. The former struck him exceedingly. He asked again, What? Do they go to a place of great pain and fire? These people, he said, sacrifice oxen, goats, pigeons, etc. I asked him if he knew what this was for, and then explained the design of sacrifices, and told him of the great sacrifice. But he did not seem to understand me, and appeared pensive, after hearing that wicked men go to hell. He asked us, with great kindness, to have some of his wild honey, which was the only thing he had to offer. How surprising is the universal prevalence of sacrifices! This circumstance will, perhaps, be made use of for the universal conversion of the nations. How desirable that some missionary should go among these peoples! No prejudices, none of the detestable pride and self-righteousness of their neighbors in the plains. November 9th. Passed the Sabbath rather uncomfortably. With Mr. Blank, I read several portions of the sacred scriptures, and prayed in the afternoon. We reached Sicily Gully, a point where the Rajamal Hills jut out into the Ganges. It was a romantic spot. We went ashore and ascended an eminence to look at the ruins of a mosque. The grave and room over it of a Mussulman warrior killed in battle were in perfect preservation, and lamps were still lighted there every night. We saw a few more of the hill people, one of whom had a bow and arrows. They were in a hurry to be gone, and went off, men, women, and children, into their native woods. As I was entering the boat, I happened to touch with my stick the brass pot of one of the Hindus, in which rice was boiling. So defiled are we in their sight, that they thought the pollution passed from my hand, through the stick and the brass, to the meat. He rose and threw it all away. November 13th. This morning we passed Kolgong. I went ashore and had a long conversation with two men. As I approached more and more to religion, they were the more astonished, and when I mentioned the day of judgment, they looked at each other in the utmost wonder, with a look that expressed, How should he know anything about that? I felt some satisfaction in finding myself pretty well understood in what I said. But they could not read and no people came near us, so I had the grief of leaving this place without supplying it with one ray of light. Looking around this country, and reflecting upon its state, is enough to overwhelm the mind of a minister or missionary. When once my mouth is opened, how shall I ever dare to be silent? Employed as yesterday, at night met with some boatmen on the bank, and a fakir with them. I talked a good deal, and some things they understood. The fakir's words I could scarcely understand. As he said he could read, and promised to read a testament, I gave him one, and several tracts. November 17th. Early this morning they set me ashore to see a hot spring. A great number of Brahmins and fakirs were there, note, men professing to be religious, who live upon charity, and note. Not being able to understand them, I gave away tracts. Many followed me to the Bodjero, where I gave away more tracts and some testaments. Arrived at Mongir about noon. 
In the evening some came to me for books, and among them those who had travelled from the spring, having heard the report that I was giving away copies of the Ramayuna. Note, a poem called Sacred by the Hindus. End note. They would not believe me when I told them that it was not the Ramayuna. I gave them six or eight more. In the morning tried to translate, with the Munshi, one of the Nagri papers. November 18th. A man followed the Bujuro along the walls of the fort, and finding an opportunity, got on board with another, begging for a book, not believing but that it was the Ramayuna. As I hesitated, having given as many as I could spare for one place, he prostrated himself to the earth, and placed his forehead in the dust, at which I felt an indescribable horror. I gave them each a testament. Employed in writing out the parables and translating. In the evening met with two villagers, and finding they could read, I brought them to the boat, and gave them each a testament and some tracts. November 19th. Employed in translating the parables all the day. Finished reading the first book of the Ramayuna. Came to at a desert place on the north side, where, in my walk, I met with a man with whom I conversed, but we could understand each other but very little. To a boy with him who could read, I gave some tracts. Felt extraordinarily wearied with my labor these two or three last days, and should have been glad of some refreshing conversation. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Martin arrived at Dinapore on the twenty sixth November, his principal objects, besides discharging his duties as chaplain to the English residents there, were to establish schools for the children of the natives, to learn to speak Hindustani, and to translate the scriptures and religious tracts into that language for distribution among the people. There are so many dialects in India that it is a great labor to study the language, so as to be understood by the inhabitants of different parts of the country. In these employments he persevered, though meeting with ridicule and opposition, not only from the natives, but even from his own irreligious countrymen who formed his congregation. "'Let me labor,' he said, "'for fifty years amidst scorn, and without seeing one soul converted.' Still it shall not be worse for my soul in eternity, nor even worse for it in time. He continued to translate the parables with explanations, and devoted his whole time to preparations for his missionary work, excepting when he had an opportunity of personally addressing the natives who could understand him, and accepting the time spent with his English congregation, and the sick at the hospital. We have another proof of the reality of religion and the truth of divine promises in the manner in which Martin was enabled to persist in his object in circumstances which would have induced any other person than a Christian to abandon it in despair. There he stood, almost alone, surrounded by idolaters and Mohammedans who ridiculed his attempts to enlighten them and were not moved by all his arguments for the religion of Christ. The English who were settled there were engaged in trade, and it was a great object with them that the natives should be kept ignorant, that they might be more easily managed in business concerns. Of course they would not countenance the plans of Mr. Martin, and scarcely treated him with respect. So solitary was he, amidst persons so different in feeling from himself, that happening to meet a poor Jew from Babylon, he said he felt all the tenderness of a kinsman towards him, and found himself, as it were, at home with an Asiatic, who acknowledged the God of Abraham. Another source of consolation, known only to the true follower of Christ, is thus intimated by him. Oh, how shall I sufficiently praise my God, that here in this solitude, with people enough indeed, but without a saint, I yet feel fellowship with all those who, in every place, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I see myself travelling on with them, and I hope I shall worship with them in his courts above. Notwithstanding these obstacles, such was his conviction of the truth of the gospel, and that it was his duty to persevere, that the time passed away rapidly. 
the nature of the support and consolation which he received may be judged of from his own expressions such as these i felt more entirely withdrawn from the world than for a long time past what a dark atheistical state do i generally live in alas that this creation should so engross my mind and the author of it be so slightly and coldly regarded i found myself at this time truly a stranger and a pilgrim in the world and i did suppose that not a wish remained for anything here the experience of my heart was delightful i enjoyed a peace that passeth all understanding no desire remained but that this peace might be confirmed and increased oh why should anything draw away my attention whilst thou art ever near and ever accessible through the sun of thy love oh why do i not always walk with god forgetful of a vain and perishable world amazing patience he bears with this faithless foolish heart and suffers me to come laden with sins to receive new pardon new grace every day why does not such love make me hate those sins which grieve him and hide him from my sight i sometimes make vain resolutions in my own strength that i will think of god reason and scripture and experience teach me that such a life is happiness and holiness that by beholding his glory i should be changed into his image from glory to glory and be freed from these anxieties which make me unhappy and that every motive to duty being strong obedience would be easy he established at his own expense five schools for the children of the natives in dinapur and some neighbouring places we suppose that these schools were intended to enable the children to read and write their own language and to receive instruction in the christian religion so that they might not grow up in ignorance and idolatry like their parents there are two great reasons why this course is in all cases the most proper first because if the mind is enlightened by education it is hard to persuade a person to believe in superstitions and the second reason is that almost all the feelings and beliefs that men have are the same that have been impressed on them in youth and have been established in some degree by the power of habit it is therefore of the highest importance that the earliest habits of a child should be good and that its instructions should be in the truth for in almost all cases such a child will by the blessing of god retain his good habits and instructions and have them at length eternally fixed by religion this is the sense of the saying of solomon train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it we find the following reflections in martin's diary of the first of january eighteen o seven seven years have passed away since i was first called of god before the conclusion of another seven years how probable is it that these hands will have mouldered into dust but be it so my soul through grace hath received the assurance of eternal life and i see the days of my pilgrimage shortening without a wish to add to their number but oh may i be stirred up to a faithful discharge of my high and awful work and laying aside as much as may be all carnal cares and studies may i give myself to this one thing the last has been a year to be remembered by me because the lord has brought me safely to india and permitted me to begin in one sense my missionary work my trials in it have been very few everything has turned out better than i expected loving-kindness and tender mercies have attended me at every step therefore here will i sing his praise i have been an unprofitable servant but the lord hath not cut me off i have been wayward and perverse yet he has brought me further on the way to zion here then with sevenfold gratitude and affection would i stop and devote myself to the blissful service of my adorable lord may he continue his patience his grace his direction his spiritual influences and i shall at last surely come off conqueror may he speedily open my mouth to make known the mysteries of the gospel and in great mercy grant that the heathen may receive it and live in february eighteen o seven mr martin finished the translation of the episcopal prayer-book into the hindustani 
and on Sunday, March 15th, used it in public worship for the first time, concluding with a short address in that language. About this time he also completed his translation and explanation of the parables of our Saviour, which he intended principally for the use of the schools, but postponed for a while, lest it should excite so much prejudice as to break up the schools entirely. Every Sunday he held divine service at seven in the morning for the English people, and at two in the afternoon for the natives, after which he visited the sick in the hospital, and held a prayer meeting at his own house in the evening, for some soldiers of the army who were willing to attend. These plans were pursued under much discouragement. The following is the diary of one Sunday. The English service, at seven in the morning, I preached on Luke, chapter 22, verse 22. As is always the case when I preach about Christ, a spiritual influence was diffused over my soul. The rest of the morning, till dinner time, I spent not unprofitably in reading scripture, and David Brainerd, and in prayer. That dear saint of God, David Brainerd, is truly a man after my own heart, although I cannot go halfway with him in spirituality and devotion. I cordially unite with him in such of his holy breathings as I have attained to. How sweet and wise, like him and the saints of old, to pass through this world as a serious and considerate stranger! I have had more of this temper to-day than of late, and every duty has been in harmony with my spirit. The service in Hindustani was at two o'clock, the number of women not above one hundred. I expounded chapter three of St. Matthew, Notwithstanding the general apathy with which they seemed to receive everything, there were two or three who, I was sure, understood and felt something. But, beside them, not a single creature, European or native, was present. Yet true spirituality, with all its want of attraction for the carnal heart, did prevail over the splendid shows of Greece and Rome, and shall again here. A man at the hospital much refreshed me, by observing that if I made an acquisition of but one convert in my whole life, it would be a rich reward, and that I was taking the only possible way to this end. There were, however, some of the officers who evinced serious feelings, and one was brought to embrace the offers of salvation. Martin longed for the time when he should be qualified to go into the midst of the Hindus with the gospel. Oh, said he, in a letter to Mr. Corey, missionary at another station, that the time were come that I should be able to carry war into the enemy's territory. It will be a severe trial to the flesh, my dear brother, for us both, but it is sufficient for the disciple to be as his master, and the servant as his lord. We shall be accounted as the filth of the world, and the off-scouring of all things." But glory be to God, if we shall be accounted worthy to suffer shame for the name of the Lord Jesus. His journal of a trip to Mongir, about a hundred miles distant, shows the distress he felt, because his zeal was not greater, and because he was not so holy and spiritual as he desired to be. He had, no doubt, just reasons for lamenting many neglected opportunities for doing good, and for deploring the many wanderings of his heart from God but we are not to understand that he was outwardly wicked or careless when he speaks of his condition in such strong language. After finishing the correction of the parables, I left Dinapur to go to Mongir, spent the evening at Patna with Mr. G. in talking on literary subjects, but my soul was overwhelmed with a sense of my guilt in not striving to lead the conversation to something that might be for his spiritual good. My general backwardness to speak on spiritual subjects before the unconverted made me groan in spirit at such unfeelingness and unbelief. May the remembrance of what I am made to suffer for these neglects be one reason for greater zeal and love in time to come. April 19th. A melancholy Lord's Day. In the morning, at the appointed hour, I found some solemnity and tenderness— the whole desire of my soul seemed to be that all the ministers in India might be eminently holy, and that there might be no remains of that levity or indolence in any of us which I found in myself. The rest of the day passed heavily, for a hurricane of hot wind fastened us on a sandbank for twelve hours, 
while the dust was suffocating and the heat increased the sickness which was produced by the tossing of the boat and i frequently fell asleep over my work however the more i felt tempted to impatience and unhappiness the more the lord helped me to strive against it and to look to the fullness of jesus christ several hymns were very sweet to me particularly there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood whose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day oh may i there though vile as he wash all my sins away dear dying lamb thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of god be saved to sin no more ere since by faith i saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till i die but when this lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave then in a nobler sweeter song i'll sing thy power to save after all the acquisitions of human science what is there to be compared with the knowledge of christ and him crucified read much of the scripture history of paul and the predictions in the latter end of the revelation april twenty first again the love and mercy of the lord restored me to health and spirits began to write a sermon on walking in christ and found my soul benefited by meditation on the subject in the afternoon went on with translations arrived at sunset at mongir april twenty second spent the day at blank's found two or three opportunities to speak to him about his soul blank threw out some infidel sentiments which gave me an opportunity of speaking but to none of the rest was i able to say anything alas in what a state are mankind everywhere living without god in the world april twenty third i left mongir and got on twenty three miles toward dinapore very sorrowful in mind both from the recollection of having done nothing for the perishing souls i have been amongst and from finding myself so unqualified to write on a spiritual subject which i had undertaken alas the ignorance and carnality of my miserable soul how contemptible must it be in the sight of god april twenty fourth still cast down at my utter inability to write anything profitable on this subject and at my execrable pride and ease of heart oh that i could weep in the dust with shame and sorrow for my wickedness and folly yet thanks are due to the lord for showing me in this way how much my heart has been neglected of late i see by this how great are the temptations of a missionary to neglect his own soul apparently outwardly employed for god my heart has been growing more hard and proud let me be taught that the first great business on earth is to obtain the sanctification of my own soul so shall i be rendered more capable also of performing the duties of the ministry whether amongst the europeans or heathen in a holy and solemn manner oh how i detest that levity to which i am so subject how cruel and unfeeling is it god is my witness that i would rather from this day forward weep day and night for the danger of immortal souls but my wickedness seems to take such hold of me that i cannot escape and my only refuge is to commit my soul with all its corruption into the hands of christ to be sanctified and saved by his almighty grace for what can i do with myself my heart is so thoroughly corrupt that i cannot keep myself one moment from sin april twenty sixth in prayer at the appointed hour i felt solemnity of mind and an earnest desire that the lord would pour out a double portion of his spirit upon us his ministers in india that every one of us may be eminent in holiness and ministerial gifts if i were to judge for myself i should fear that god had forsaken his church 
for I am most awfully deficient in the knowledge and experience requisite for a minister. But my dear brother Corey, thanks be to God, is a man of a better spirit. May he grow more and more in grace, and continue to be an example to us. Pass the day in reading and prayer, such as my prayers are. My soul struggled with corruption, yet I found the merit and grace of Jesus all-sufficient and all-supporting. Though my guilt seemed like mountains, I considered it as no reason for departing from Christ, but rather for clinging to him more closely. Thus I got through the day, cast down, but not destroyed. April 27th. Left Patna and arrived at Dinapur. The concourse of people in that great city was a solemn admonition to me to be diligent in study and prayer. Thousands of intelligent people together, no Sabbath, no word of God, no one to give them advice. How inscrutable the ways of God! Martin had made considerable progress in translating the scriptures into the language of India. He now, at the suggestion of Mr. Brown, a missionary near Calcutta, applied himself diligently to finishing the work, and to oversee, also, a translation into Persian. This became a delightful employment, as his own expressions show. The time fled imperceptibly, while so delightfully engaged in the translations. The days seemed to have passed like a moment. Blessed be God for some improvement in the languages. May everything be for edification in the church. What do I not owe to the Lord for permitting me to take part in the translation of his word? Never did I see such wonder and wisdom and love in the blessed book, as since I have been obliged to study every expression, and it is a delightful reflection that death cannot deprive us of the pleasure of studying its mysteries. All day on the translations, employed a good while at night in considering a difficult passage, and being much enlightened respecting it, I went to bed full of astonishment at the wonder of God's word. Never before did I see anything of the beauty of the language and the importance of the thoughts as I do now. I felt happy that I should never be finally separated from the contemplation of them, or of the things about which they are written. Knowledge shall vanish away, but it shall be because perfection shall come. Then shall I see as I am seen, and know as I am known. What a source of perpetual delight have I in the precious book of God! Oh, that my heart were more spiritual, to keep pace with my understanding, and that I could feel as I know! May my root and foundation be deep in love, and may I be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. And may I be filled with all the fullness of God. May the Lord, in mercy to my soul, save me from setting up an idol of any sort in his place, as I do by preferring even a work professedly done for him to communion with him. How obstinate is the reluctance of my natural heart to love God! But, O oh my soul, be not deceived. Thy chief work upon earth is to obtain sanctification and to walk with God. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Let me learn from this that to follow the direct injunctions of God as to my own soul is more my duty than to be engaged in other works under pretense of doing him service. How sweet the retirement in which I here live! The precious word is now my only study in the work of translation, though in a manner buried to the world, neither seeing nor seen by Europeans. The time flows on here with great rapidity. It seems as if life would be gone before anything is done, or even before anything is begun. I sometimes rejoice that I am not twenty-seven years of age, and that, unless God should order it otherwise, I may double the number in constant and successful labor. If not, God has many, many more instruments at command, and I shall not cease from my happiness, and scarcely from my work, by departing into another world. Oh, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Neither death nor life, I am persuaded. Oh, let me feel my security, that I may be, as it were, already in heaven, that I may do all my work as the angels do theirs. And, oh, 
Let me be ready for every work, be ready to leave this delightful solitude, or remain in it, to go out or go in, to stay or depart, just as the Lord shall appoint. Lord, let me have no will of my own, nor consider my true happiness as depending in the smallest degree on anything that can befall my outward man, but as consisting altogether in conformity to God's will. May I have Christ here with me in this world, not substituting imagination in the place of faith, but seeing outward things as they really are, and thus obtaining a radical conviction of their vanity. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Martin now received intelligence from England of the death of his eldest sister, an event which very deeply affected him, but which caused him to feel fresh confidence in God and a new interest in heaven. O oh, great and gracious God, what should I do without thee? But now thou art manifesting thyself as the God of all consolation to my soul. Never was I so near thee. I stand on the brink and long to take my flight. There is not a thing in the world for which I could wish to live, except the hope that it may please God to appoint me some work. And how shall my soul ever be thankful enough to thee, O thou most incomprehensibly glorious Saviour Jesus! Oh, what hast thou done to alleviate the sorrows of life, and how great has been the mercy of God towards my family, in saving us all! How dreadful would be the separation of relations and death, were it not for Jesus! The European letter, he wrote to Mr. Brown, contained the intelligence of the death of my eldest sister. A few lines received from herself about three weeks ago gave me some melancholy forebodings of her danger. But though the Lord thus compassionately prepared me for this affliction, I hardly knew how to bear it. We were more united in affection to each other than to any of our relations, and now she is gone I am left to fulfill as a hireling my day, and then I shall follow her. She had been many years under some conviction of her sins, but not till her last illness had she sought in earnest for salvation. Some weeks before her death she felt the burden of sin, and cried earnestly for pardon and deliverance, and continued in the diligent use of the appointed means of grace. Two days before her death, when no immediate danger was apprehended, my youngest sister visited her, and was surprised and delighted at the change which had taken place. Her convictions of sin were deep, and her views clear. Her only fear was on account of her own unworthiness. She asked, with many tears, whether there was mercy for one who had been so great a sinner, though in the eyes of the world she had been an exemplary wife and mother, and said that she believed the Lord would have mercy upon her, because she knew he had wrought on her mind by his spirit. Two days after this conversation, she suddenly and unexpectedly left this world of woe, while her sister was visiting a dying friend at a distance. This, you will tell me, is precious consolation. Indeed, I am constrained to acknowledge that I could hardly ask for greater, for I had already parted with her for ever in this life, and in parting all I wished for was to hear of her being converted to God, and, if it was his will, taken away in due time from the evil to come, and brought to glory before me. Yet human nature bleeds. Her departure has left this world a frightful blank to me, and I feel not the smallest wish to live, except there be some work assigned for me to do in the church of God. And some time afterwards he wrote, My heart is still oppressed, but it is not a sorrow that worketh death, though nature weeps at being deprived of all hopes of ever seeing this dear companion on earth, faith is thereby brought the more into exercise. How sweet to feel dead to all below, to live only for eternity, to forget the short interval that lies between us and the spiritual world, and to live always seriously. The seriousness which this sorrow produces is indescribably precious. 
Oh, that I could always retain it, when these impressions shall be worn away. In September he introduced Christ's Sermon on the Mount as a lesson for the schools. The first time he had been privileged to hear the natives reading and learning any portion of the sacred scriptures. He declined the urgent request of his friends in Calcutta to establish himself there, saying that, however delightful it would be to be placed in the society of the missionaries and their families, he wished to remain more in the midst of the heathen, upon whom he desired to expend his labors. His solitude was also rendered more painful by the disappointment of his hopes of marriage with the lady at Cornwall, to whom he was engaged, but who now felt obliged to decline the union, for reasons which Mr. Martin himself admitted to be proper. He bore this trial with much meekness. He said, The Lord sanctify this, and since this last desire of my heart is also withheld, may I turn away for ever from the world, and henceforth live forgetful of all but God. With thee, O oh my God, is no disappointment. I shall never have to regret that I have loved thee too well. Thou hast said, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. At first I was more grieved, he wrote some time afterwards, at the loss of my gourd than for all the perishing Ninevehs around me. But now my earthly woes and earthly attachments seem to be absorbing in the vast concern of communicating the gospel to these nations. After this last lesson from God on the vanity of the creature, I feel desirous to be nothing, to have nothing, to ask for nothing but what he gives. At the close of the year he thus spoke of this event, and the death of his sister. On both these afflictions I have seen love inscribed, and that is enough. What I think I want, it is better still to want, but I am often wearied with this world of woe. I set my affections on the creature, and am then torn from it, and from various other causes, particularly the prevalence of sin in my heart, I am often so full of melancholy that I hardly know what to do for relief. Sometimes I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, then would I flee away and be at rest. At other times, in my sorrow about the creature, I have no wish left for my heavenly rest. It is the grace and favor of God that have saved me hitherto. My ignorance, waywardness, and wickedness would long since have plunged me into misery. But there seems to be a mighty exertion of mercy and grace upon my sinful nature every day to keep me from perishing at last. My attainments in the divine life in this last year seem to be none at all. I appear, on the contrary, to be more self-willed and perverse, and more like many of my countrymen, in arrogance and a domineering spirit over the natives. The Lord save me from my wickedness. Henceforth let my soul, humbly depending upon the grace of Christ, perfect holiness in the fear of God, and show towards all, whether Europeans or natives, the mind that was in Christ Jesus. Mr. Morton had two assistants in his Indian and Persian translations, one named Mirza of Hindustan, the other Sabat, an Arabian. The latter of these, for some time, professed to be a convert to Christianity, but afterwards returned to Mohammedism. Sabat's temper and behavior were so inconsistent with the spirit of the gospel that he gave Mr. Martin great uneasiness. But his expressions of a desire to reform seemed so sincere that he was long regarded as a genuine Christian, whom, it was hoped, more light and knowledge and grace would gradually lead aright. In March 1808, Martin completed the New Testament in Hindustani and sent it to Calcutta to be printed. The correcting of the sheets as they came from the press occupied much of his time, besides which he superintended and compared the Persian translation by Sabat, and studied the Arabic, that he might have a translation made into that language also. He received visits daily from such of his congregation as were serious, and visited the hospital as usual. In consequence of the want of a proper place for public worship at Dinapur, he held meetings at his own house. On the first Sunday he preached from Isaiah chapter 4 verse 5, The Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and upon her assemblies, 
a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. In the afternoon, his diary relates, I waited for the women, but not one came. Perhaps, by some mistake, notice had not been given them. At the hospital, and with the men at night, I was engaged as usual in prayer. My soul panted after the living God, but it remained tied and bound with corruption. I felt as if I could have given the world to be brought to be alone with God, and the promise that this is the will of God, even our sanctification, was the right hand that upheld me while I followed after him. When low in spirits, through an unwillingness to take up the cross, I found myself more resigned in endeavouring to realise the thought which had often composed me in my trials on board the ship, namely, that I was born to suffer, that suffering is my appointed daily portion. Let this reconcile me to everything. To have a will of my own, not agreeable to God's, is a most tremendous wickedness. I own it is so, for a few moments, but, Lord, write it on my heart. In perfect meekness and resignation let me take whatever befalls me in the path of duty, and never dare to think of being dissatisfied. In June the Gospel of Matthew was finished in Persian, and sent to Calcutta, where it was printed at the expense of the British and Foreign Bible Society. In the summer he suffered a severe attack of illness, his reflections on which show the spirituality of his feelings, and the joyfulness of his prospects of eternity. I little thought to have had my faith brought to a trial so soon. This morning, while getting up, I found a pain in the centre of my body, which increased to such a degree that fever and vertigo came on, and I fainted. The dreadful sensation was like what I once felt in England, but by no means so violent or long continued, as then also I was alone. After recovering my senses, and lying in pain which almost made me breathless, I turned my thoughts to God, and, oh, praise to His grace and love, I felt no fear, but I prayed earnestly that I might have a little relief to set my house in order and make my will. I also thought with pain of leaving the Persian Gospels unfinished. By means of some ether the Lord gave me ease, and I made my will. The day was spent in great weakness, but my heart was often filled with the sweetest peace and gratitude for the precious things God hath done for me. I found delight at night in considering, from the beginning, all that God had done in creation, providence, and grace for my soul. O oh God of love, how shall I praise thee? Happiness, bliss for ever, lies before me. Thou hast brought me upon this stage of life to see what sin and misery are, myself, alas, most deeply partaking in both. But the days and the works of my former state, fraught with danger and with death, are no more, and the God of benevolence and love hath opened to me brighter prospects. Thine I am, my beloved is mine, and I am his, and now I want none but thee. I am alone with thee in this world, and when I put off this mortal tabernacle, I shall still be with thee, whatever that unknown change may be, and I shall be before thee, not to receive honour, but to ascribe praise. Yes, I shall then have power to express my feelings. I shall then, without intermission, see and love, and no cloud of sorrow overcast my mind. I shall then sing in worthy, everlasting strains the praises of that divine Redeemer, whose works of love now reach beyond my conception. Some portions of his letters to the Rev. Messrs. Corey and Brown at Calcutta during this year, and part of 1809, will show his labours, trials, and consolations in a better manner than our narrative could. I do not know how you find the heat, but here it is dreadful. In one person's quarters yesterday it was at 102 degrees. Perhaps it was on that account that scarcely any women came. Another reason I assign is that I rebuked one of them last Sunday, yet very gently, for talking and laughing in the church before I came. So yesterday they showed me their displeasure by not coming at all. I spoke to them on the parable of the great supper. The old woman, who was always so exemplary in her attention, shed many tears. 
I have sometimes endeavored to speak to her, but she declines conversation. I feel interested about her. There is so much sorrow and meekness depicted in her countenance, but she always crosses herself after the service is over. My Europeans this week have not attended very well. Fifteen only, instead of twenty-five. Some of them indeed are in the hospital, and the hospital is a town of itself. How shall I ever be faithful to them all? Among the events of the last week is the earthquake. We were just reading the passage of the 24th of Matthew on earthquakes in diverse places, when I felt my chair shake under me. Then some pieces of the plaster fell, on which I sprang up and ran out. The doors had still a tremulous motion. I groan at the wickedness and infidelity of men, and seem to stretch my neck every way to espy a righteous man. All at Dinapur treat the gospel with contempt. Here there is nothing but infidelity. A young civilian, who some time ago came to me, desiring satisfaction on the evidences of Christianity, and to whom I spoke very freely and with some regard, as I could not doubt his sincerity, now holds me up to ridicule. Thus, through evil report, we go on. Oh, my brother, how happy I feel that all have not forsaken Christ, that I am not left alone, even in India. Cast thy burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain thee, is the text I carry about with me, and I can recommend it to anybody as the infallible preservative from the fever of anxiety. The day after I wrote to you from Bankapur, I called on the Nawab, note, or Nabab, the name of an office, and note, Babir Ali Khan, celebrated for his sense and liberality. I stayed two hours with him, conversing in Persian, but badly. He began the theological discussion by requesting me to explain necessity and free will. I instantly pleaded ignorance. He gave his own opinion, on which I asked him for his proofs of the religion of Muhammad. The first argument was the eloquence of the Quran, but he at last acknowledged that this was insufficient. I then brought forward a passage or two in the Quran containing sentiments manifestly false and foolish. He flourished a good deal, but concluded by saying that I must wait till I could speak Persian better, and had read their logic. This was the first visit, and I returned highly delighted with his sense, candor, and politeness. Two days after, I went to breakfast with him, and conversed with him in Hindustani. He inquired what are the principles of the Christian religion. I began with the atonement, the divinity of Christ, the corruption of human nature, the necessity of regeneration, and a holy life. He seems to wish to acquire information, but discovers no spiritual desire after the truth. I mentioned to you that I had spoken very plainly to the women last Sunday on the delusions of the papists. Yesterday only seven came. I ascribed it to what I had said. But today Sabat tells me that they pour contempt upon it all. Sabat, instead of comforting and encouraging me in my disappointments and trials, aggravates my pain by contemptuous expressions of the perfect inutility of continuing to teach them. He may spare his sarcastic remarks, as I suppose, after another Sunday, none at all will come. I find no relief but in prayer. To God I can tell all my griefs and find comfort." One day this week, on getting up in the morning, I was attacked with a very serious illness. I thought I was leaving this world of sorrow, and praised be to the God of grace, I felt no fear. The rest of the day I was filled with sweet peace of mind, and had near access to God in prayer. What a debt of love and praise do we owe! Yesterday I attempted to examine the women who attended, in number about thirty, in Christian knowledge. They were very shy, and said that they could say no prayers but in Portuguese. It appears that they were highly incensed, and went away, saying to Joseph, We know a great deal more than your priest himself. The services much weakened me after my late attack. The men are fast dying in the hospital, yet they would rather be sent to Patna for some holy oil than hear the word of eternal life. Two or three of my evening hearers are in the hospital. One is prepared to die, blessed sight. The Persian of St. Mark is to be sent tomorrow, and five chapters of Luke corrected. There is no news from down the stream, 
but always glad tidings for us from the world above. The following is from a letter to his sister in England. I am sorry that I have not good accounts to give of my health, yet no danger is to be apprehended. My services on the Lord's day always leave me a pain in the chest, and such a great degree of general relaxation that I seldom recover from it till Tuesday. A few days ago I was attacked with a fever, which, by the mercy of God, lasted but two days. I am now well, but must be more careful for the future. In this debilitating climate, the mortal tabernacle is frail indeed. My mind seems as vigorous as ever, but my delicate frame soon calls for relaxation, and I must give it, though unwillingly, for such glorious fields for exertion open all around, that I could with pleasure be employed from morning to night. It seems a providential circumstance that the work at present assigned me is that of translation, for had I gone through the villages preaching, as my intention led me to do, I fear that by this time I should have been in a deep decline. In my last I gave you a general idea of my employments. The society still meet every night at my quarters, and though we have lost many by death, others are raised up in their room. One officer, a lieutenant, is also given to me, and he is not only a brother beloved, but a constant companion and nurse, so you must feel no apprehension that I should be left alone in sickness, neither on any other account should you be uneasy. You know that we must meet no more in this life. Therefore, since we are, as I trust, both children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, it becomes a matter of less consequence when we leave this earth. Of the spread of the gospel in India I can say little, because I hear nothing. Adieu, my dearest sister. Let us live in constant prayer for ourselves and for the church. The annexed extracts are from his correspondence with Messrs. Corey and Brown. I have just come out of my chapel, where, with my little flock, I have once more resumed my duties. The infrequency of my appearance among them of late has thinned them considerably, and this effect which I foresaw is one of the most painful and lamentable consequences of my withdrawing from them. But it is unavoidable if I wish to prolong my life. My danger is from the lungs, though none of you seem to apprehend it. One complete service at church does more to consume my strength and spirits than six days of the hardest study or bodily labor. Pray for me, my dear brother, that I may neither be rash nor indolent. You mention a letter enclosed, but none came. The intelligence, however, intended to be conveyed by it, met my delighted eyes. Thomason is coming. This is good. Praise be to the Lord of the harvest for sending out laborers. Behold how the prayers of the society at Calcutta have been heard. I hope they will continue their supplication, for we want more yet, and it may please God yet further to bless us. You cannot leave Calcutta by the middle of November, and must therefore apply for a one month's extension of leave. But you are unwilling to leave your flock, and I do not wonder, as I have seen my sheep grievously dispersed during my absence. Uncertain when I may come amongst them, they seldom come at all, except the ten or twelve who meet one another. My morning congregation increases as the cold weather advances, and yesterday there seemed to be a considerable impression. I spoke in a low tone of voice, and therefore did not feel much fatigue. After the Hindustani service I was very weak, but at night tolerably strong again. On the whole my expectations of life return. May the days thus prolonged be entirely his who continues them, and may my work not only move on delightfully, but with a more devout and serious spirit. Your letter from Buxar found me in much the same spiritual state as you describe yourself to be in, though your description no doubt belongs more properly to me. I no longer hesitate to ascribe my stupor and formality to its right cause, unwatchfulness in worldly company. I thought that any temptation arising from the society of the people of the world, at least as such as we have had, was not worthy of notice. But I find myself mistaken. The frequent occasions of being among them of late have proved a snare to my corrupt heart. Instead of returning with a more elastic spring to severe duties as I expected, my heart wants more idleness, more dissipation. 
David Brainerd in the wilderness, what a contrast to Henry Martyn! But God be thanked that a start now and then interrupts the slumber. I hope to be up and about my master's business, to cast off the works of darkness, and to be spiritually minded, which alone is life and peace. But what a dangerous country it is that we are in! Hot weather or cold, all is softness and luxury, all a conspiracy to lull us to sleep in the lap of pleasure. While we pass over this enchanted ground, call, brother, ever and anon, and ask, Is all well? We are shepherds keeping watch over our flocks by night. If we fall asleep, what is to become of them? Last Friday we had the happiness and honour of finishing the four Gospels in Persian. The same evening I made some discovery respecting the Hebrew verb, but was unfortunately so much delighted that I could not sleep, in consequence of which I have had a headache ever since. Thus even intellectual joys are followed by sorrow, not so spiritual ones. I pray continually that order may be preserved in my heart, that I may esteem and delight most in that work which is really most estimable and delightful, the work of Christ and his apostles. When this is in any measure the case, it is surprising how clear and orderly the thoughts are on other subjects. I am still a good deal in the dark respecting the objects of my pursuit, but have so far an insight that I read both Hebrew and Arabic with increasing pleasure and satisfaction. I scarcely know how this week has passed, nor can I call to mind the circumstances of one single day, so absorbed have I been in my new pursuit. I remember, however, that during one night I did not sleep a wink. Knowing what would be the consequence the next day, I struggled hard and turned every way, that my mind might be diverted from what was before it, but all in vain. One discovery succeeded another, in Hebrew, Arabic, and Greek, so rapidly that I was sometimes in almost ecstasy. But, after all, I have moved but a step. You may scold me if you please, but I am helpless. I do not turn to this study of myself, but it turns to me, and draws me away almost irresistibly. Still I perceive it to be a mark of a fallen nature, to be so carried away by a pleasure merely intellectual. And therefore, while I pray for the gifts of his spirit, I feel the necessity of being still more earnest for his grace. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But charity never faileth. Yesterday my mind was mercifully kept free the whole day, and I ministered without distraction, and moreover without fatigue. I do not know when I have found myself so strong. The state of the air affects me more than anything else. On Saturday I completed my twenty-eighth year. Shall I live to see another birthday? It will be better to suppose not. I have not read Faber yet, but it seems evident to me that the eleventh of Daniel, almost the whole of it, refers to future time. But as the time of accomplishing the scriptures draws on, knowledge shall increase. In solemn expectation we must wait to see how our God will come. How interesting are his doings! We feel already some of that rapture wherewith they sing above, Great and wonderful are thy works, Lord God Almighty! Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints! I did not write to you last week, because I was employed night and day, on Monday and Tuesday, with Sabat, in correcting some sheets for the press. I begin my letter now, immediately on receiving yours of last week. The account of your complaint, as you may suppose, grieves me exceedingly, not because I think that I shall outlive you, but because your useful labours must be reduced to one quarter of their present amount, and that you may perhaps be obliged to take a voyage to Europe, which involves loss of time and money. But, O oh, brother beloved, what is life or death? Nothing to the believer in Jesus. He that believeth, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The first and most natural effect of sickness, as I have often found, is to cloud and terrify the mind. The attention of the soul is arrested by the idea of soon appearing in a new world, and a sense of guilt is felt, before faith is exercised in a Redeemer, and for a time this will predominate, 
for the same faith that would overcome fear in health must be considerably strengthened to have the same ascendancy in sickness. I trust you will long live to do the work of your Lord Jesus. My discoveries are all at an end. I am just where I was, in perfect darkness, and tired of the pursuit. It is, however, likely that I shall be constantly speculating on the subject. My thirst after knowledge is very strong, but I pray continually that the Spirit of God may hold the reins, that I may mind the work of God above all things, and consider all things else as merely occasional. The preceding extracts show the progress of Martin and Sabat in their translations, the debility of Martin's health, and the new temptations of study which were presented to his mind. In March 1809 a large place of worship was opened, but he was not permitted to enjoy many services in it, as he was sent by the East India Company to be chaplain at Cawnpore, almost four hundred miles from Dinapore, and seven hundred from Calcutta. This journey he performed at the hottest season of the year. For two days and nights he travelled without stopping, during which time the wind seemed to him like flames, and he lay in his palanquin almost insensible. A lady of Cawnpore speaks as follows of his tour. The month of April, in the upper provinces of Hindustan, is one of the most dreadful months for travelling throughout the year. Indeed, no European at that time can remove from place to place but at the hazard of his life. But Mr. Martin had that anxiety to be in the work which his heavenly father had given him to do, that notwithstanding the violent heat, he travelled from Chunar to Cawnpore, the space of about four hundred miles. At that time, as I well remember, the air was as hot and dry as that which I have sometimes felt near the mouth of a large oven. No friendly cloud or verdant carpet of grass to relieve the eye from the strong glare of the rays of the sun pouring on the sandy plains of the Ganges. Thus Mr. Martin travelled, journeying night and day, and arrived at Cawnpore in such a state that he fainted away as soon as he entered the house. When we charged him with the rashness of hazarding his life in this manner, he always pleaded his anxiety to get to the great work. He remained with us ten days, suffering considerably at times from fever and pain in the chest. At Cawnpore there was no church or regular worship. Soon after his arrival, Martin preached to the soldiers in the open air, when such was the heat, although before sunrise, that many dropped down as they stood around him in ranks. He adopted the same course of public services as at Dinapore, and continued to superintend the Arabic and a new Persian translation of the New Testament, as the first one was found too imperfect for publication. These duties occupied his whole time, excepting when his duties occasionally required him to take journeys to distant towns. Having received intelligence of the fatal illness of his only sister, the last tie to earthly objects seems to have been broken. "'What is there now?' he exclaimed, "'that I should wish to live for. "'Oh, what a barren desert! "'What a howling wilderness does this world appear! "'But for the service of God and his church, "'and the preparation of my own soul, "'I do not know that I would wish to live another day.' "'It was this sister who first attempted to draw his attention to religion. "'And how must he have looked back upon the day, "'when, as he confessed, the sound of the gospel from her lips was grating to his ear. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Life of Rev. Henry Martin by John Hall This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Martin had been accustomed to give alms to a number of the poor natives, and to avoid the frequent interruption of his studies which their calls occasioned, he fixed a time for them to come to his door. As a great number of wretched beings was thus collected, he determined to embrace the opportunity of attempting to preach to them. Of his first address to them he has left this account. I told them, after requesting their attention, that I gave with pleasure the alms I could afford, but wished to give them something better, namely eternal riches, or the knowledge of God which was to be had from God's word and then producing a Hindustani translation of Genesis, read the first verse, and explained it word by word. In the beginning, when there was nothing, no heaven, no earth, but only God, he created without help, 
for his own pleasure. But who is God? One so great, so good, so wise, so mighty, that none can know him as he ought to know, but yet we must know that he knows us. When we rise up, or sit down, or go out, he is always with us. He created heaven and earth, therefore everything in heaven, sun, moon, and stars. Therefore, how should the sun be God, or the moon be God? He created everything on earth, therefore Ganges also. Therefore, how should Ganges be God? Neither are they like God. If a shoemaker make a pair of shoes, are the shoes like him? If a man make an image, the image is not like man, his maker. Infer, secondly, if God made the heavens and the earth for you, and made the meat also for you, will he not also feed you? Know also that he who made heaven and earth can destroy them, and will do it. Therefore fear God, who is so great, and love God, who is so good. I bless God, said Mr. Martin, for helping me beyond my expectation, yet still my corrupt heart looks forward to the next attempt with some dread. On the Sunday after this he preached to at least five hundred of this class. I did not, he remarks, succeed so well as before, I suppose because I had more confidence in myself and less in the Lord. I fear they did not understand me well but the few sentences that were clear they applauded. Speaking to them of the sea and rivers, I spoke to them again of the Ganges, that it was no more than other rivers. God loved the Hindus, but he loved other people too, and whatever river or water or other good thing he gave the Hindus, he gave other people also, for all are alike before God. Ganges, therefore, is not to be worshipped, because so far from being a god, it is not better than other rivers. In speaking of the earth and moon, as a candle in the house, so is the sun, I said, in the heavens. But would I worship a candle in my hand? These were nice points. I felt as if treading on tender ground, and was almost disposed to blame myself for imprudence. I thought that amidst the silence these remarks produced, I heard hisses and groans, but a few Mohammedans applauded. The number of persons on these occasions sometimes amounted to eight hundred, composed of Mohammedans and pagans, and though it was natural for them to be very respectful and attentive, in the supposition that their ill behavior might cause Martin to refuse them charity, yet it was evident that many were really interested in the new doctrines he taught them. They sometimes made sensible remarks in assent to what he declared, or kept entire silence, as if deeply thinking on it. They were very much moved at one time when, after detailing the history of God's judgment on Sodom, the preachers suddenly applied the subject to themselves. "'Do you, too,' he said, "'repent of your sins, and turn to God. For though you are not like the men of Sodom, God forbid, you are nevertheless sinners. Are there no thieves, railers, extortioners among you?' Be you sure that God is angry. I say not that he will burn your town, but that he will burn you. Haste, therefore, out of Sodom. Sodom is the world, which is full of sinners and sin. Come out, therefore, from amongst them. Forsake not your worldly business, but your sinful companions. Do not be like the world, lest you perish with them. Do not, like Lot, linger. Say not, to-morrow we will repent, lest you never see to-morrow. Repent to-day. Then, as Lot seated on the hill, beheld the flames in safety, you also, sitting on the hills of heaven, shall behold the ruins of the world without fear. But his health beginning to suffer from his labors and the heat of the climate, he was, with great reluctance, compelled to give up this portion of his services. He wrote to his friend, Mr. Simeon, I read your letter of 6th of July, 1809, cautioning me against overexertion, with the confidence of one who had nothing to fear. This was only three weeks ago. Since the last Lord's Day, your kind advice was brought home to my mind, accompanied with painful regret that I had not paid more attention to it. 
My work last Sunday was not more than usual, but far too much for me, I can perceive. First, service to His Majesty's 53rd Regiment in the open air, then at headquarters. In the afternoon, preached to 800 natives, at night, to my little flock of Europeans. Which of these can I forego? The ministration of the natives might be in the week, but I wish to attach the idea of holiness to the Sunday. My evening congregation, on Sunday, is attended by twice as many as in the weekday, so how can I let this go? He was assisted for some time by Mr. Corey from Calcutta, and once more attempted to address the beggars, but his weakness and other symptoms of declining health increased so much that it became necessary for him to leave Cawnpore. At first he determined to visit England for a short time, thinking that he could there best renew his strength, but he afterwards concluded to visit Persia and Arabia, that he might collect the opinions of the learned natives respecting the accuracy of the translation of the New Testament into those tongues, the first of which was supposed to be written in a style not likely to be understood by the common people, and therefore not yet published, and the last being still unfinished. On the 1st of October, 1810, he left Cawnpore for this purpose, thus connecting the pursuit of health with his great missionary enterprise. As at Dinapore, he left this station just as a new church was completed, in which he had the happiness of preaching the first sermon, the day before his departure. On his voyage down the Ganges to Aldeen, he visited the part of the army he had before served, but most of those of whom he had cherished the strongest hopes had neglected his warnings, and were ashamed to see him. Nine only came to his boat, where he sang, prayed with, and exhorted them. At Aldeen and Calcutta he enjoyed the society of his dear friends, the missionaries, and preached frequently, though exceedingly weak. One of his sermons was an appeal to the Europeans on behalf of the nine hundred thousand natives of India who possessed Christianity in some form, but were destitute of the scriptures. Many of them, as he said, relapsing fast to idolatry, and already, indeed, little better than heathens. Mention not their meanness. It is yours to raise them from degradation. Despise not their inferiority, nor reproach them for their errors. They cannot get a Bible to read. Had they been blessed with your advantages, they would have been, perhaps, more worthy of your respect. It has been said with too much truth that they scarcely deserve the name of Christians. How is it possible that it should be otherwise, without the Bible, when it is considered how little oral instruction they receive? The sermon concluded with this address. Imagine the sad situation of a sick or dying Christian, who has just heard enough of eternity to be afraid of death, and not enough of a Saviour to look beyond it with hope. He cannot call for a Bible to look for something to support him, or ask his wife or child to read him a consolatory chapter. The Bible, alas, is a treasure which they never had the happiness to possess. Oh, pity their distress! You that have hearts to feel for the miseries of your fellow creatures, you that have discernment to see that a wounded spirit is far more agonizing than any earth-begotten woes, you that know that you too must one day die, oh, give unto him what may comfort him in a dying hour. The Lord, who loves our brethren, who gave his life for them and for you, who gave you the Bible before them, and now wills that they should receive it from you, he will reward you. They cannot recompense you, but you shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. The king himself will say to you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. This sermon was printed in Calcutta, and contributed essentially to the institution of the Calcutta Bible Society, and the liberal support it received. His last discourse was in January, 1811, from the words of our Saviour, One thing is needful, after which he left India, never more to return, though hoping to recover his health and spend the remainder of his life there. I now pass, he wrote, from India to Arabia, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, but assured that an ever-faithful God and Saviour will be with me in all places, whithersoever I go. 
may he guide me and protect me, and after prospering me in the thing whereunto I go, bring me back again to my delightful work in India. I am perhaps leaving it to see it no more, but the will of God be done. My times are in his hand, and he will cut them as short as shall be most for my good, and with this assurance I feel that nothing need interrupt my work or my peace. His passage from the mouth of the river Hooghly, on which Calcutta is situated, to Shiraz, the capital of Persia, occupied five months. The particulars, which are worthy of notice, are given in his own words. Bay of Bengal, January 1811 I took a passage in the ship Amudi, Captain Kinsey, bound to Bombay. One of my fellow passengers was the Honourable Mr. Alphenstone, who was proceeding to take the residency of Pune. His agreeable manners and classical acquirements made me think myself fortunate indeed in having such a companion, and I found his company the most agreeable circumstance in my voyage. Our captain was a pupil of Swartz. Note, the life of this missionary has been published by the American Sunday School Union. End note of whom he communicated many interesting particulars. Swartz, with Kohlhoff and Yonaki, kept a school for half-caste children, about a mile and a half from Tanjore, but went every night to the Tanjore church, to meet about sixty or seventy of the king's regiment, who assembled for devotional purposes, after which he officiated to their wives and children in Portuguese. At the school, Swartz used to read in the morning, out of the German meditation for every day in the year. At night he had family prayer. Yonaki taught geography, Koloff writing and arithmetic. They had also masters in Persian and Malabar. At the time when the present Raja was in danger of his life from the usurper of his uncle's throne, Swartz used to sleep in the same room with him. This was sufficient protection, for, said the captain, Swartz was considered by the natives as something more than mortal. The old Raja, at his death, committed his nephew to Swartz. January 27th to 31. Generally unwell. In prayer my views of my Saviour have been inexpressibly consolatory. How glorious the privilege that we exist but in Him! Without Him I lose the principle of life, and am left to the power of native corruption. A rotten branch— a dead thing that none can make use of. This mass of corruption, when it meets the Lord, changes its nature, and lives throughout, and is regarded by God as a member of Christ's body. This is my bliss, that Christ is all. Upheld by him I smile at death. It is no longer a question about my own worthiness. I glory in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. February 18th anchored at Bombay. This day I finished the thirtieth year of my unprofitable life, the age at which David Brainerd finished his course. I am now at the age of which the Saviour of men began his ministry, and at which John the Baptist called a nation to repentance. Let me now think for myself, and act with energy. Hitherto I have made my youth and insignificance an excuse for sloth and imbecility, now let me have a character, and act boldly for God. February 24th. Preached at the Bombay Church. March 25th. Embarked on board the Benares, Captain Seeley, who in company with the Prince of Wales, Captain Hepburn, was ordered to cruise in the Persian Gulf against the Arab pirates. We got under way immediately, and were outside the land before night. March 31st. The European part of the ship's crew, consisting of forty-five sailors and twelve artillerymen, were assembled on the quarter-deck to hear divine service. I wondered to see so many of the seamen inattentive, but I afterwards found that most of them were foreigners—French, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. We had prayers in the cabin every night. In the afternoon I used to read to a sick man below, and two or three others would come to hear. April 21st anchored at Muscat, in Arabia. May 22nd, landed at Bushire. On 30th of May, our Persian dresses were ready, and we set off for Shiraz. The Persian dress consists of, first, stockings and shoes in one, next, a pair of large blue trousers, 
or else a pair of huge red boots, then the shirt, then the tunic, and above it the coat, both of chintz and a great coat. I have here described my own dress, most of which I have on at this moment. On the head is worn an enormous cone, made of the skin of the black tartar sheep, with the wool on. If, to this description of my dress, I add that my beard and mustachios have been suffered to grow undisturbed ever since I left India, that I am sitting on a Persian carpet, in a room without tables or chairs, and that I bury my hand in the dish, without waiting for spoon or plate, you will give me credit for being already an accomplished Oriental. At sunrise we came to our ground at Amadi, and pitched our little tent under a tree. It was the only shelter we could get. At first the heat was not greater than we had felt in India, but it soon became so intense as to be quite alarming. When the thermometer was above 112 degrees, fever heat, I began to lose my strength fast. At last it became quite intolerable. I wrapped myself up in a blanket, and all the warm covering I could get, to defend myself from the external air, by which means the moisture was kept a little longer upon the body, and not so speedily evaporated as when the skin was exposed. One of my companions followed my example, and found the benefit of it. But the thermometer still rising, and the moisture of the body being quite exhausted, I grew restless, and thought I should have lost my senses. The thermometer at last stood at 126 degrees. In this state I composed myself, and concluded that though I might hold out a day or two, death was inevitable. Captain Blank, who sat it out, continued to tell the hour and height of the thermometer, and with what pleasure did we hear of its sinking to 120 degrees, 118 degrees, etc. At last the fierce sun retired, and I crept out, more dead than alive. It was then a difficulty how I could proceed on my journey, for besides the immediate effects of the heat, I had no opportunity of making up for the last night's want of sleep, and had eaten nothing. However, while they were loading the mules, I got an hour's sleep, and set out, the muleteer leading my horse, and Zechariah, my servant, an Armenian of Ifashan, doing all in his power to encourage me. The cool air of the night restored me wonderfully, so that I arrived at our next stopping place, with no other derangement than that occasioned by want of sleep. Expecting another such day as the former, we began to make preparation the instant we arrived on the ground. I got a shelter made of the branches of the date tree, and a Persian peasant to water it. By this means the thermometer did not rise higher than 114 degrees. But what completely secured me from the heat was a large wet towel which I wrapped round my head and body, muffling up the lower part in clothes. How could I but be grateful to a gracious providence for giving me so simple a defence against what, I am persuaded, would have destroyed my life that day? We took care not to go without nourishment as we had done. The neighbouring village supplied us with curds and milk. At sunset, rising up to go out, a scorpion fell upon my clothes. Not seeing where it fell, I did not know what it was, but Captain Blank, pointing it out, gave the alarm and I struck it off, and he killed it. The night before, we found a black scorpion in our tent. This made us rather uneasy, so that, although we did not start till midnight, we got no sleep, fearing we might be visited by another scorpion. The next morning we arrived at the foot of the mountains. A strong, suffocating smell of naphtha, note, a substance like liquid pitch, supposed to be produced by subterranean fire, end note, announced something more than ordinarily foul in the neighbourhood. We saw a river, what flowed in it, it seemed difficult to say, whether it was water or green oil. It scarcely moved, and the stones which it laved it left of a greyish colour, as if its foul touch had given them the leprosy. Our place of encampment this day was a grove of date trees. I threw myself down on the burning ground and slept. When the tent came up, I awoke, as usual, in a burning fever. All this day I had recourse to a wet towel, which kept me alive, but would allow of no sleep. It was a sorrowful Sabbath, but Captain Blank read a few hymns, in which I found great consolation. 
At nine in the evening we decamped. The ground and air were so insufferably hot that I could not travel without a wet towel round my face and neck. This night, for the first time, we began to ascend the mountains. The road often passed so close to the edge of the tremendous precipices that one false step of the horse would have plunged his rider into inevitable destruction. In such circumstances I found it useful to attempt guiding the animal, and therefore gave him the rein. These poor animals are so used to journeys of this sort that they generally step sure. There was nothing to mark the road but the rocks being a little more worn in one place than in another. Sometimes my horse, which led the way, as being the muleteers, stopped, as if to consider about the way. For myself, I could not guess at such times where the road lay, but he always found it. The sublime scenery would have impressed me much in other circumstances, but my sleepiness and fatigue rendered me insensible to everything around me. At last we emerged, not on the top of a mountain, to go down again, but to a plain or upper world. We rode briskly over the plain, breathing a purer air, and soon came in sight of a fair edifice built by the king of the country for the refreshment of pilgrims. In this caravan, Sarah, we took up our abode for the day. It was more calculated for eastern than European travellers, having no means of keeping out the air and light. We found the thermometer at 110 degrees. At the passes we met a man travelling down to Bushire with a load of ice which he willingly disposed of to us. The next night we ascended another range of mountains and passed over a plain where the cold was so piercing that with all the clothes we could muster we were shivering. At the end of this plain we entered a dark valley contained by two ranges of hills approaching one another. The muleteer gave notice that he saw robbers. It proved to be a false alarm, but the place was fitted to be a retreat for robbers, there being on each side caves and fastnesses from which they might have killed every man of us. After ascending another mountain, we descended by a very long and circuitous route into an extensive valley, where we were exposed to the sun till eight o'clock. Whether from the sun, or from continued want of sleep, I could not, on my arrival at Karzaroon, compose myself to sleep. There seemed to be a fire within my head, my skin like a cinder, and the pulse violent. Through the day it was again too hot to sleep, though the place we occupied was a sort of summer-house, in a garden of cypress trees, exceedingly well fitted up with mats and coloured glass. Had the caravan gone on that night, I could not have accompanied it but it halted here a day, by which means I got a sort of night's rest, though I woke up twenty times to dip my burning hands in water. The Karzaroon is the second greatest town in Fars. We could get nothing but bread, milk, and eggs, and those with difficulty. June 7th. The hours we were permitted to rest, the mosquitoes had effectually prevented me from using, so that I never felt more miserable and disordered. The cold was very severe, for fear of falling off from sleep and numbness, I walked a good part of the way. We pitched our tent in the vale of Dostarjan, near a crystal stream. The whole valley was one green field, in which large herds of cattle were browsing. The temperature was about that of a spring in England. Here a few hours' sleep recovered me, in some degree, from the stupidity in which I had been for some days. I awoke with a light heart, and said, He knoweth our frame, and remembereth we are dust. He redeemeth our life from destruction, and crowneth us with loving kindness and tender mercies. He maketh us to lie down on green pastures, and leadeth us beside the still waters. And when we have left this vale of tears, there is no more sorrow, nor sighing, nor any more pain. The sun shall not light upon thee, nor any heat but the Lamb shall lead thee to living fountains of waters. June 8th. Went on to a caravansera, where we passed the day. At night set out upon our last march for Shiraz. Sleepiness, my old companion and enemy, again overtook me. I was in perpetual danger of falling off my horse, till at last I pushed on to a considerable distance, planted my back against a wall, and slept, I know not how long, till the good muleteer came up, 
and gently waked me. End of chapter 9